Well, welcome everyone and thank you for joining our webinar today on careers in global health and how to advise your students. My name is Sophie Teague and I'm the Senior Marketing Manager for Public Health and Health Administration here at Jones and Bartlett. Um, and for those of you who are not familiar with Jones and Bartlett Learning, we are a provider of instructional assessment and learning performance resources for the secondary, post-secondary and professional markets. Um, and we specialize in the areas of health and safety. Let me now introduce you to our featured presenter, Richard Skolnick. Um, Richard Skolnick was uh, most recently a lecturer at the Yale School of Public Health and the Yale School of Management, where he taught introductory and advanced global health courses. He has more than 40 years of experience in development and global health work. Uh, he spent 25 years at the World Bank, retiring as the Director for Health and Education for the South Asia region. Uh, after leaving the World Bank, Richard was the Vice President for International Programs at the Population Reference Bureau. He was the Director of the Center for Global Health at the George Washington University, where he taught undergraduate global health courses for nine years. Um, Richard also served as the Executive Director of the Harvard PEPFAR program for AIDS treatment in Botswana, Nigeria, and Tanzania. Um, and in addition, Richard has served on a number of international technical and advisory boards. Richard, of course, is the author of Global Health One and One, uh, one of our best-selling texts uh, here at Jones and Bartlett. It's now in its third edition and continues to be a favorite textbook for undergraduates in public health. Uh, and I should also mention that uh, he's just uh, launched a new um, MOOC, Massive Open Online Course, uh, with Yale on Coursera. And it just uh, just went live last week, so I encourage everyone to check that out, it's called Essentials of Global Health. So at this point, I will now hand things uh, over to Richard to present. Sophie, thank you very much for the very, as always, very gracious introduction and also for the wonderful work you do to both help me and to help other faculty like those who are on the line. I want to thank everyone very much for joining. It's an honor to meet all of you today. I know uh, some of you personally already, and I very much hope to have an opportunity to meet the rest of you uh, over time. By the time we finish this seminar, I hope we'll have an opportunity to exchange views on the goals of advising students on global health careers, some key questions that students need to answer to prepare for and seek such careers, how to help students get answers to those questions, key resources for us and for students on global health careers, and how we collectively advise on careers in global health. And I want to highlight that although I'm going to make some remarks and ask a friend to make some remarks as well, I do hope that in addition to questions and answers, that everyone will feel very free to share ideas about how they advise students about careers in global health so that we might learn as much as possible from each other. Before we proceed, I should probably, if not certainly, make clear to you my own perspectives and biases. Um, one is I really come to this from the, being a global health practitioner who then became a global health educator and had the honor of teaching about 40 to 45 different global health courses at the introductory and advanced level in a university, college setting, a public health school setting, and remarkably even in a business school setting. Uh, and, and two is that I managed a very large group at the World Bank uh, and um, a substantial group at the Population Reference Bureau and at Harvard, and, and therefore I've had the good fortune of um, understanding something about the kinds of um, jobs that are available in global health and the kinds of skills, experience, and approach that are needed uh, if one wants to work in that field. You probably think I saw an insane number of students so that I'm not telling the truth, but those of you who know me knew that I commuted from Washington to New Haven, and being alone three nights a week in New Haven, I basically spent my Wednesdays taking advantage of the graciousness of my former colleagues all over the world and ran pretty much a job shop in terms of both summer internships and placements. And I also found an enormous amount of personal satisfaction meeting with students, learning from them, engaging with them. And so I, I uh, tried to uh, build on that, uh, the many, many students I've met, as well as my past career, to put together some comments uh, today that I hope will be uh, valuable 
and we'll encourage everyone to share their own ideas with each other. I want to start by suggesting uh, that depending on the level of the students, and we're looking now at what students don't know, I think very few undergraduate students um, have thought systematically about careers of any type or know how to do so. Often they'll come to you and say, I think I want to pursue this graduate degree, but they've not yet thought about what it is that they might want to do through what platform or the knowledge, skills, and experience needed to, to get there. They've rarely thought about different routes of gaining those no, that knowledge, skills, and experience, and most of them have very little idea about what I believe is really essential to professional growth, and that is the importance of mentors and how so much of what we become professionally will depend on the people with whom the, we have the, the honor um, to work. So I wanted to here to start our interaction by saying, um, at least for undergraduate students, do you find they don't know very much about systematically thinking about careers in global health? If your students don't, don't think systematically about careers in global health when you meet them, please press yes and Sophie will help you to do that. If your students do think systematically, please press no and forgive the backwardness of that. Sophie, do you want to remind them how to do that? Yep, sure. So you'll want to click on the feedback button, which is on the right-hand side of your screen. It's a little icon that looks like a talking bubble with a check mark in it. Just click that and you'll get the yes or no option. So the, the question is, uh, my students don't think systematically about global health careers. Yes, if they don't think systematically, no, if they do. Please go ahead. And we'll give one second here. Let, let. Sophie, are you seeing enough to give any good feedback so far? I do see. Um, and the, the, um, currently we've got 20 people saying yes and nine people saying no. And uh, I do have some people saying they don't see the button. Feel free to also use the chat box or the Q&A box if you'd prefer, just to type yes or no or whatever answer you'd like. Um, but the feedback button is on the right-hand side with a, a talking bubble with a check mark. And now we're up to 11 no's and 20 yeses. Okay, so what we're seeing is that about two-thirds of you say your students don't think, when they at least first come to you, and presumably the relatively younger students, they, they generally haven't thought very systematically about careers in global health. So let's look at the next slide, and I think consistent with this, there are a number of questions, not all of which are on here, that these students will, will ask. Of course, the, the first one many students will ask is, are there jobs in global health? I want to devote my life to this, but I really worry, both because I don't know so much about it, but also because so many students are interested and so many students want internships and so many students are going to schools of public health or becoming physicians or nurses or clinicians. Are there jobs? And if so, what kind of jobs are there? Do I need to be a physician or do I need to be a clinician um, uh, in order to engage in global health work or to be taken seriously? Uh, if there are these kinds of jobs, how, how do I get them? Um, what kind of preparation do I need in order to do that? And another interesting question or set of questions, of course, concerns ethical issues related to global health work. And I wanted to comment on that for a minute. Uh, these, of course, are very important to all of us. In our meetings with students, we no doubt all um, talk about and engage with them on ethical issues. But I think the way in which students engage, at least it's my experience, will depend on where they are in school, both in what country and what region and what kind of school they attend. I find that in many cases students find a calling, they want to do this work, but they want to ensure that they engage in it in the most ethical um, manner and the most respectful manner, and their questions will revolve around that. But in some universities, you'll have students will come to you and say, I believe it's unethical to engage in work as someone from a high-income country on places that are low- and middle-income country, but maybe you can convince me otherwise or just tell me I'm right so I can go find some other career. But I find these ethical issues uh, interesting and challenging, but I found the kind of question to vary uh, substantially depending on uh, where the students are. Now, 
I found over time, especially since I spent so much time meeting students, that it was really essential that I ask my students to prepare uh, for our meetings. I found some students are very respectful of their time and my time. I found some other students less respectful, thinking I'd have hours for them. But over, over the 15 years in which I've been involved in global health education and advising students on careers, what I found is that by insisting that they prepared for our meeting in specific ways, that the meeting could be more effective and more efficient and maximize both their time and mine. And I asked the students, once they asked to meet me, I asked them to prepare for such a meeting by providing their resume, which I then critique for them, by giving me five lines on what they want me to say about them 15 years from now and the impact they're having on global health, and from what platform, five lines on who they think they might want to be like, uh, actors in the global health arena. I asked them to give me the three most important questions on which they want my advice, even if I wind up answering 10 or 15. And I asked them to read the two career chapters of my third edition, chapters 18 and 19, one on working in global health and one on profiles of global health actors, because I found Otherwise, I just keep repeating the same thing over and over and over again in a way that wasn't productive. And finally, I remind them that whether it's me or others uh, from whom they seek jobs, it's important that they um, act as if they had 10 or 15 minutes, even if they're going to get more, and that they seek to maximize the value of this conversation, which might not come along, uh, the opportunity for which might not come along very often. And again, I wouldn't at all suggest that this is the only way or the best way, but I can say this has worked out quite well for me and helped, I think, myself and my students to have much more focused, much more valuable discussions. So if I might ask one more question of all of you, uh, do you ask your students to prepare before you meet to discuss global health careers with them? Sophie is gonna remind you, how to, how to press yes if you ask them to prepare, or no if you don't ask them for, to prepare. Yep, and so again, the feedback button is an icon on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, if you click participants, um, you should see it at the bottom of that participants window, and you can uh, just click that and get a drop-down for either yes or no, and click one. And we are getting some responses. So far we have 23 no's and 16 yeses. Okay, well, that's, that's, the, that, that's very interesting. Answer. I'm sorry, Sophie, please go ahead. I was just going to say you can also type your answer into the chat box or the Q&A. Thank you so much. It looks like they're running close to 50-50. And I do hope that we can create fora, perhaps at the Unite for Sight conference or others, in which those uh, in which we can share more ideas about uh, how the conversations go from those of us who don't feel we have to uh, make our students prepare and how the conversations go and how different people ask their students to prepare in different ways. Um, and I'll try my best to see if we can find fora for further exchanging views on that. I, I, when, when, when I do meet students, I generally try to assist them, uh, as you would expect given what I've said so far, to see the range of global health careers, to understand you don't need to be a clinician, to think in systematic ways and work from the end to the knowledge, skills, and experience uh, they need, to not start by talking about where they want to go to school, but start by trying to identify what they might want to do. And I should have said, of course, many students really won't have very much idea at all, and that's also okay. Uh, if the student comes to me and says, I really don't know where to begin, I think I have a calling for this, or I have an ethical obligation to this, or I want to make the world a better place, but I really don't know how, I tell them, especially in schools where everybody thinks they need to know the first day what their career will be, I try to tell them this is perfectly sensible, this is perfectly fine, and here are ways, for example, that you can learn more about different career options in global health. Here are ways you can identify role models and see how different people worked in global health and try to identify people you might want to be like. And why don't you go look at some of those things 
and let's let's meet again in two or three or four weeks after you've done some more homework, talked to more to some more people. And um, in this case, depending again, I think on where where you're teaching, um, one sometimes has to help the students understand that exploring is a good thing and that not always knowing exactly what they want to do the first day of their first year uh, can be a very good thing and then to help them explore in, in thoughtful ways. Um, and so once we get beyond that, then what I do is try, as you would expect, to move, as I'm sure you do, to providing more specific information in helping them to define or uh, develop the specific interests that they might have by talking with them about some resources, and there aren't very many, by pointing them to people in career services, if I know some who actually know something about global health and not everybody does, by pointing them to former students on campus or at other schools if they've given me permission, who can be of value in helping them to think about global health careers. Uh, and I also, um, again, as I mentioned, always engage with the students on the importance of uh, humility and thinking about ethical issues in this work. I think, again, this depends on where you are. If you're in London, Geneva, or Washington, the students probably have a pretty good sense of um, the humility that's required before any of us would hire someone to work in global health. But there are schools where they encourage students, many students, to write resumes and talk with people uh, as if they were only going to work for well-paid consulting firms and where they don't stress humility. And that can produce some uh, occasionally uncomfortable and sometimes comical discussions. I had a student at a university, well, well I won't mention, who asked me to vet her cover note and resume. She wrote to a Nobel laureate in physiology, I believe it was, at NIH, the National, U.S. National Institutes of Health, talking about the unique value she could add as a summer intern. Not many students will do that, but again, I think the importance of humility and discussions of ethical issues are important, and the more students are prepared and the more homework they've done and the more they develop their interests and understanding of possibilities, the more specific we can be, I think, in, in helping them. And all of us are very familiar with this, but I think um, in the next few slides, I've tried to outline a, a, a few of the specific ways in which I would encourage the students to think about the more specific. I think unless they have systematic ways of thinking about this, it's very hard for them and they'll continue to flounder. So I always talk with them about dividing the world of global health work into a number of selected areas. And these aren't the only ones, but like research, policy, program design and implementation, program evaluation, or advocacy. We could make a very long list, as you see in the next slide, of selected functional areas of global health work, but I also try to you know, engage with them, as I know you do too, on what do you think are your emerging interests? Are you interested in women's health, children's health, adolescent health, the forgotten critical issues of mental health, neglected tropical diseases, um, health systems, et cetera? Uh, quality of health services. Uh, and uh, again, it, it doesn't always happen in one discussion, but over time, try to help them think systematically about the areas of work, the functional areas of work, and finally, as you see in the next slide, the types of global health organizations that are engaged in global health work and the platforms from which they may eventually engage in global health work uh, themselves. I, I've been disappointed by the relatively small number of coherent resources available to students and faculty about careers in global health. And that's why I was forced, uh, as well as to save my own time and that of my students, to write these career chapters in my book. But I've also found very, very useful the YouTube channel called Global Health with Greg Martin. Uh, Greg is someone for whom I have great appreciation and affection. He's joining us today, and in a few minutes, I'll ask Greg to give some additional comments, uh, always value-adding comments, I must say. And Greg's YouTube channel is engaging. It's fun. That's the kind of thing that relatively younger and even more mature students and professionals 
tell me they very much enjoy. There are thousands of participants in the channel, and Greg has a series on global health careers, and I've always found it useful and fun, and I point my students to that, and I want to encourage you to do the same. And Unite for Sight, as many of you know, has lots of very good discussion of global health careers on a regular basis throughout the year in a series of webinars, and some of which I've had the honor of participating. And at their annual conference, there's also lots of very good discussion of careers as well. Um, I have a few books that talk about different issues in global health careers, including issues, ethical issues. I'm sure you have the same. I hope if I'm missing resources and I try to keep up that you'll feel free to send me an email that I can share with others. But um, I, I would encourage students at least to start with looking at some of these resources if you try to assist them in thinking more systematically about global health careers, defining where they might go and trying to define as well how they might get there. And finally, of course, as they seek careers, there are a number of valuable websites, and these aren't the only ones uh, at all, uh, which might be their first line of call as they try to get a sense of where some of these jobs might be, especially if they need to look at the kind of clearinghouses um, be before they're so familiar with specific employers, whether it's JSI or PSI or Comonix or RTI or, or others. Um, and and Sophie will be giving everyone a copy of the slides, um, a fair amount of this. Most of this is also in my book, and Greg and others do a good job of talking about this uh, as well. So. Um, I'm going to stop here with a profound thanks to all of you for joining. I'm going to repeat my hope that you will not only ask questions of each other, really, but at the same time feel free to let us, any of all of us know um, practices in which you're engaged that you think can be of value to the rest of us as we seek to assist our, um, our, our students and young colleagues in thinking more systematically about global health careers and getting as close as they can to realizing the dreams that they have of working in this field. So, Sophie, I'll turn it back to you with thanks to you and to all of those who've joined as well. And then in a few minutes, I'll, I'll trouble Greg for a couple of comments. Great. Thank you so much, Richard. Uh, so at this point, we'll turn to a question and answer session, and if you have a question, I very much encourage you to voice your question out loud. You'll need to press star 1 on your telephone key keypad, and that's going to send a message to our operator, Taryn, um, and she will queue up um, your lines and, and open each one in turn so that you can ask your question out loud. If you prefer to type your question, you can certainly do that, and um, you can do that in either the chat box or the Q&A box. I'll be monitoring both. Um, and I'll, I'll read your question out loud uh, for Richard to answer. Um, so at this point, I guess, uh, Taryn, let's uh, start off. Let me see if there's any calls uh, on the telephone line. And there are no questions. Thank you at this time. Okay, great. Uh, and I do have a question um, on the um, chat box um, from someone asking, how does an instructor develop a sense of professionalism in undergraduates? <laughs> that, like others, is a very, is a very good question. Um, I think one, one way of doing it, and this might seem trite but is sincere, is requiring it um, in the classroom and requiring it uh, in the assignments and the manner in which the assignments are being done. And, you know, I think if you assign policy briefs, for example, to your students as I did, and then you read them really rigorously and try your best to hold your students to good professional standards that you know they're going to face in the workplace, I think we'll be doing them a service. Now, not every student's got perfect SAT scores. Not every student can write perfectly. Not every student is as linear and coherent as others. But I think we should try to help all of our students to reach the highest professional standard that they can reach in all of the work that we can do. I know that many universities have a, a writing center, but not all universities have a speaking center. And I find many of my students much less good at presenting 
than they are orally than they are in writing. And I find by holding them to high standards in, in the way in which they discuss or raise issues in class or in tutorial sessions, by holding them to high standards when they present, you know, I found that they're both learning what we would expect them to learn, for example, at a good liberal arts uh, college or university, but at the same time, they're much better prepared to go into the world of work where I, people will expect that of them. I think the, the last one is, um, and, and somewhat more difficult, and that is, you know, how do you help them to become more culturally competent, forgive my use of the word? How do you help them to learn how to speak more diplomatically? And I think depending on how you teach and whether you use cases or not, et cetera, that one has to be very careful about case studies because uh, one, one can turn them easily into insult. Uh, I think one can use those as well, uh, case studies and discussions, uh, to help students learn to um, get a better feel for the way in which they'll have to speak uh, and relate to people and interact and work in teams, for example, uh, as they become more professional members of the global health community. I, I, I hope those are happy, helpful to you. And uh, I, I try my best to answer questions that are posed to me uh, uh, separate from webinars, so if anyone has questions that you feel I can help to answer or help get others to answer, please, after the seminar, don't hesitate to send me an email, and I'll do my very best to respond in the next few days to all of them. Sophie, let's take another one. Great. Thank you, Richard. I will also repeat the instructions for um, voicing your question, and we welcome your comments as well. You don't have to have a question. Um, press star one on your telephone keypad and Karen will open your line. Um, in the meantime, I do have a question here on, um, let's see, I have heard several times that for those interested in careers that involve actually working in low and middle income countries that the Peace Corps is almost a pre prerequisite to obtaining paid positions. Is this something that you would recommend as well? Uh, uh, thank you for that question as well. And, uh, I would answer it more broadly, and I think I would answer it by saying, if students want to work in low or middle income countries, it's really essential that they get experience in those kinds of countries. It's almost impossible to get a feel for the circumstances of, of any place if you haven't been in these kinds of settings. And it's also, of course, almost impossible to be taken seriously or to have credibility working in the field if you haven't spent substantial time in these kinds of settings, haven't um, studied or learned a number of languages, and haven't developed a, a kind of feel that you can reflect uh, in the workplace for these kinds of environments, um, how they work and don't work, uh, and the kinds of critical health issues that they face. So I think that is just uh, essential, though not always so easy for everyone to get. And indeed, if you're an American citizen, uh, the Peace Corps is one very valuable potential way of getting such experience. There are also others, I try to list them in the book, and there are other lists as well. Most religious groups have um, a kind of Peace Corps of their own, whether it's Mennonite relief or, uh, um, uh, or, or others. And I think what we have to do is appreciate the real importance of such experience for students and hopefully do our best to enable them to find how they might actually be able to get ex those experiences. I'll say one last thing, and that is, you know, can domestic experiences in some settings substitute for this. And I would say living now in New Mexico, um, there, which is one of the poorest states in the United States where 30% of our children are in poverty uh, and where we have very substantial um, numbers um, and a very substantial share of the population is a marginalized Native American population. These experiences are extremely helpful. And I've worked with lots of students who have worked uh, with Native Americans marginalized communities of immigrants or refugees, uh, poor people in the United States. These are very, very valuable, but I still think, and I'll ask Greg to comment in a few minutes, uh, by and large, 
one has to get experience in low and middle income countries if those are the kinds of countries to which one wants to devote one's professional life. Uh, please go ahead, Sophie. Absolutely, and I do have uh, read out one comment here. Um, for cultural sensitivity, I have the students read Fademan's book, uh, When the Spirit Catches You. And let's see, let me also turn to Taryn. Uh, Sophie, um, Sophie, ask... Sophie can, I, can I just comment for one second on that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but that's a very, very thoughtful comment. Those of you who I've had the pleasure of meeting at the Unite for uh, Site uh, conference will know that every other year I do a session on teaching global health, and it's become a really wonderful forum for learning from each other. And indeed, I think as I mentioned, uh, Sophie, in the last webinar we did, indeed many faculty ask the students to prepare for their classes or to prepare for getting a better sense and feel for global health by asking them to read a number a book or a number of books or certain articles in advance. Certainly Tracy Kidder's book on Paul Farmer is one, and certainly um, The Spirit Catches You by Ann Fadiman is another, and I, I, uh, I'm nobody special, but uh, I was a fellow of Brantford College at Yale with Ann, and I have to tell you she's just an unbelievably extraordinary, not just extraordinary, a truly unbelievably extraordinary woman. And I, I do think this notion, I asked my students to take a look at Poor Economics by Banerjee and Dufflo as well. And um, I think one of my blogs to which we can refer you later has a list of a number of very thoughtful suggestions like the one just made for which I'm very grateful. I apologize, Sophie, back to you. Nope, no, that's great. Thank you for that. And I do encourage everyone to, if you have comments, please, feel free to type those uh, in the chat or Q&A, or if you'd like to voice them, you can do that as well. Um, Karen, do we ha speaking of which, do we have any questions on the line? No, ma'am, not at this time. Sophie, maybe I can turn to Greg now. Will this be okay with you? Absolutely. So I, I mentioned a minute ago the Global Health Channel with Greg Martin, and I'm, I'm very pleased and honored that uh, Greg uh, is on the line. I encourage you to look, as I mentioned, at his channel and uh, at his uh, really engaging and fun uh, videos on global health careers. And uh, Greg, having thought about this so much and it having been so gracious as to join us today, I wonder if we could ask you to make a few comments um, of your own that might help to address the, the thoughts on the mind of those who joined the webinar. Please go ahead. And Taryn uh, and Greg as well, if you can press star one and then Taryn can open your line. Well, how about we turn to another question, and Greg, if you can continue to uh, try and find star one on your telephone keypad, and Taryn, if we can open up his line, that'd be great. In the meantime, I'll just go, uh, go ahead to the next question that we have here. Um, let's see. Um, do you have suggestions for an infectious disease physician considering a second career after retirement from the U.S. practice with ongoing short-term volunteer work in Africa? If the person would like to write, write to me, I'll be happy to point them towards specific friends who are really engaged in this field and can probably be, certainly be more helpful than me. But I think, of course, uh, it depends in some respects on um, how long one wants to spend um, working on these issues and whether or not one is prepared to work overseas. I think if you're prepared to, to live, for example, in the United States, and take on periodic assignments, then one might have to work independently and work with certain kinds of organizations. And, and that could be uh, any of the organizations, such as the consulting firms, um, JSI, PSI, RTI, MSH, et cetera. It could be some of the uh, non nonprofits as well. It could be some of the humanitarian organizations. By contrast, I think if one is prepared to spend time living in and working in low or middle income countries, then I think the, again, one could go to some of those same organizations that might be seeking to place people overseas, uh, as well as uh, through contracts that they've won, for example, with USAID, or one could work um, with uh, organizations, again, on more specific uh, assignments of a specific time. So my, my experience suggests that there are many opportunities for this work. 
But as Greg actually says in one of his videos very well, it's, it's important that people get to know who you are and what you can do, um, hopefully as your career develops. But again, I invite the person to feel free to write to me. I'll be happy to chat further with, with them and be as helpful as I can be to point them toward um, some of the folks I know uh, that they might wish to make contact with if this is what they'd really like to do for the next phase of their career. Great, thank, thank you, you Richard. Yep, and it appears, um, Karen, we, we may have, um, I, I did communicate with Greg and it looks like we might have a little bit of a technical issue. Um, he is trying to get through. Karen, are you able to open his line? Yes, ma'am, his line is open. Oh, if, if I talk, can people hear me? Yes, Greg. Yes. Greg, oh, I can't thank you enough for joining. I'm glad we overcame these. Greg, I, I hope you heard me, but I'm honored and grateful that you would join. And in light of what you've heard and what you've known and the wonderful videos you've made, I wanted to ask if you could make a few uh, a few comments that can be of value, Thanks, I know, to all of us. Thanks so much, Richard. And, uh, and to, it's, a, it's an honor for me to be uh, sharing a platform with you. Um, you know, and, and Richard, as you know, you've Hi. been a tremendous mentor to myself. Um, in fact, a lot of what I say on the YouTube channel is uh, basically cut and paste straight from your book, um, which... I was uh, really grateful you, you, you once on the telephone gave me permission to kind of just really dig in and use any of the material that I thought was necessary, and, and, and I really have. So, um, <laughs> so I'm really grateful for that. I think a lot of what, I, a lot of what you said about careers uh, in the global health space resonates with exactly what I, the advice that I would give to young people uh, and, you know, people at any point in their career, because I think very often in global health, there are opportunities for people to reinvent themselves. So. Um, in fact, I'm uh, at the age of 43. I've gone back into a public health training program um, to, you know, to, to get involved in public health in a, in a different way than I was involved before. So I think it's, you know, there, there, there's so many exciting things that one can do. Uh, it's all, you almost sometimes feel like a child in a candy shop. And you're not quite sure which, which bits of uh, chocolate to eat first. I find, um, but. I suppose the, the advice that I often give, because I get a lot of questions on my YouTube channel, um, what should I study, where should I go, what should I do? And I like to advise that people firstly take a good, strong look at themselves and then take a good, hard look at the global landscape. And, and, you know, and, and, if, and if you have a good look at those two things, you can often do a little bit of matchmaking and see where the overlaps are. So, for example, you know, looking inwardly at yourself, you would think about, well, what are my interests? And as, as, as Richard alluded to, you'd think about, what am I interested in? And you won't necessarily know offhand, but this, this may emerge as you, you know, as you kind of get involved and you study, et cetera, but you might be involved, more interested in certain diseases or certain population groups or certain disciplines uh, or some sort of combination of those. Um, I encourage people to think about the role that they would like to play because, they, like, global health is a very broad, generic thing. So find out about what roles exist within organizations. There's monitoring and evaluation. There's research. There's management. There's communications. There's uh, program management. So people need to be thinking about of what actually gets done on a day-to-day -day basis, the nuts and bolts of reality on the ground in a, a, a nonprofit or working for a governmental organization or maybe in the private sector, what are the actual roles that exist? Uh, think about your competencies and, 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 and your own aptitude. So what is your knowledge and experience and your, your disposition? What are the things you like to do? Do you like working with numbers? Do you hate working with numbers? I mean, those are important things to kind of have clear in your own mind. And then once you've had that kind of introspective look and you've got a sense of what you want or at least an, an emerging sense of it, take a good hard look at the global health landscape in a very similar way. So you would say, of the organizations out there, what are their interests? Let me try and understand that the mapping out of this, you know, I, if I'm interested in HIV, uh, which organizations are interested in HIV or human rights or conflict and health or some sort of combination of these things? Um, and in the same way that I suggest that people think about their own role and what role they would like to play, they need to be thinking about the organization's role. Is it, are they interested in working for a funding organization or an implementing partner or an organization that does research or an organization that's involved in advocacy, for example? And then, of course, there's the different types of organizations, NGOs, governmental, private sector, PPPs, et cetera. 
And last but not least, and this actually circles back to what you were talking about a few, a few seconds ago, Richard, and that is where in the world you would like to live. Um, and I think anybody that's interested in global health is almost de facto interested in emerging countries that are in emerging economies or, 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 or poor countries or developing countries. And uh, I understand the frustration that young people often feel, and it's the old chicken and egg. How do I get a job in one of these NGOs or in one of these countries if I haven't got the experience that's needed to apply for the job to get the experience? I mean, and, and I, that there's no easy way around that other than sometimes to, you know, to do internships or to work as a volunteer. But I think sometimes it's probably worth mentioning that young people need to be a little less panicky about getting the exact experience that they want because sometimes that emerges. So, for example, when I finished my MPH many years ago, I was very keen to go and work in a developing country, but I couldn't quite see the right opportunity. But I took a role as a, a, a clinical research fellow at LSHDM, so I was based in London. That role happened to give me lots of opportunity to travel and work in Ghana and Indonesia, and I hadn't expected that. It just kind of emerged. Um, and that experience, of course, then opened up doors for further experience, and it's kind of like a bit of a, you know, a, a domino effect. So, um, you know, I'd encourage students not to feel too anxious about that if they genuinely have an interest in developing countries and they get involved, you know, in, in whatever capacity and, and within whatever organization they're able to. Um, very often those opportunities will emerge and they just need to be prepared to jump on them when they do. Um, but uh, I, I, and I, I, and I won't say any more about that, but um, Richard, is there anything else you'd like me to talk about or no, Greg, that's back over to you? No, Greg, thank you very much. I can't thank you enough. That's extremely valuable and I, I think you're much better than I am at en enabling and provoking introspection and I come at it in a slightly different way and I'm very grateful that you would raise that. So I, uh, I really appreciate it very much and encourage people to take a look at your channel, which I looked at again this morning and enjoyed thoroughly. And Sophie, let's give it back to you to see if there are additional questions. Okay, great. Thank you, Greg and Richard. And uh, yeah, we have another question here. Um, for students intrigued by careers in this field, are there options accessible with a bachelor's degree or is grad school the reality? So I, I would say if this is a field in which you want to devote your, to which you want to devote yourself in the long run, eventually some kind of graduate training is probably, if not certainly, necessary. Maybe less necessary, for example, if you're going to do journalism and advocacy. Uh, certainly more necessary if you want to be a disease detective of the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Uh, certainly more necessary if you want to engage in academic work. But having said that, I think if you're in the right city, um, you know, especially or can get there, there are a, a substantial number of entry-level positions uh, in global health where even though one might start with relatively simple tasks, if one is lucky enough to work with the right people who appreciate one's talents, uh, one can, I think, even as a first degree holder, um, learn a great deal make some substantive contributions, get a better fix on what you want to do, and then set a better foundation for further study and further work in the field. There aren't that many organizations that are going to take an under, a first degree holder and send them tomorrow morning to Tanzania to work on reproductive health. But there are a fair number that would give the student an opportunity to participate in a project on reproductive health, and after some years, and after some time, see if this is a person of talent, get them more and more involved. Um, and I could point you to um, a fair number of my first degree holding students who are working in Washington especially, um, and almost all of whom they'll later do go back, uh, seek to work at higher levels, and seek additional training in order to do that. And I guess the last one, of course, is, Related to this often is these overseas experiences through religious organizations, uh, through other organizations, through the Peace Corps, things like it. Uh, please go ahead, Sophie. Uh, I was going to read off a couple of comments that we have here. I, I thought I'd read them both and then uh, let you offer comment, commentary on them um, related to, I think this is related to the professionalism question, but 
we have one person commenting that uh, he has students work on collective PowerPoint assignments. Um, he has them collect web images on the topic, for example, and for slums, he has them build visuals on the topic and then have them discuss the PowerPoint among themselves. That's the first comment. Uh, there's a second comment here about that. Um, uh, someone says that when he's a guest lecturer in global health courses, he spends a few minutes to describe to students his career path in global health, especially given that he's a biologist and not a physician or a clinician, uh, and that can be encouraging to students. He also stresses the importance of being in networks. I'll let you comment, Richard. Great. Um, thank you very much. With, first, with respect to teamwork, um, sometimes this is difficult to do because different students, you know, work in different ways at different times. But I, I think most of the faculty that I know believe that uh, work in teams uh, can, can, is really valuable and can contribute to the students becoming more professional and learning how to work in teams later, which is certainly essential. Uh, I might say that I would probably try to create teams, if it were possible, that put together students who came from different uh, academic perspectives so one could come close to mimicking some of the multidisciplinary teams that one engages in, in in development work. And so that the biologists and the future doctors and nurses and uh, other clinicians can learn to work with the epidemiologists of the future, the social scientists of the future, and the people who think in hardcore economic terms of the future. So I very much appreciate the notion, and I certainly have heard over the years lots of outstanding examples of different ways that different faculty approach um, approach uh, teamwork. Uh, so if you remind me for one second, the second one. Uh, second comment. Okay, the second, second one um, is uh, from someone who's a biologist and he's uh, sometimes a oh, guest yes. lecturer. And... Right, <laughs> okay, forgive, forgive me, I got it. Yes, I think um, also a very valuable comment. And I, I think m many of the people that I know in the field and teach global health do exactly that. Um, they try to ensure that when they have guests, whether virtually or physically, that they take advantage of the guests to help the students understand what, up, what kind of work is there in global health, um, who does such work, who, might, you know, who do you want to be like, and how do these people gain the knowledge, skills, and experience needed to get where they are. Uh, I, I've been deeply honored, I've been invited to a number of places, both virtually, and now that I'm retired from full-time teaching, I'm getting a fair number of uh, physical invita invitations to show up physically. And in each of these cases, the faculty involved have asked me to come in, you know, the night before for a dinner with students or students and faculty, which will focus specifically on careers in global health. And very often during that, although, you know, I don't like to talk about myself so much, the students always want to know, how did you get where, where you were? And what advice does that have for me? And I will say publicly, I'm working with Greg and we, we hope some uh, people who are very important in the field so that we might be able to actually record a kind of global health heroes series, series that would be updated uh, regularly and also be able to record annual updates on key topical issues in global health like malaria, HIV, et cetera. And in those, we would certainly ask, even in, even in the second one, we would ask the um, presenters to take a few minutes to talk about their own, their own paths. So I very much appreciate the idea. I think it's an excellent one. And I, um, I certainly always do that myself. Please go ahead, Sophie. Okay, Thank you, Richard. And we actually have quite a few questions coming through. Um, here are questions from two different people, essentially the same question. Um, do you have information about nurses licensed in the U.S. who are getting licensed in other countries, or what, what resources or sites are better suited for licensed healthcare practitioners? Or are, uh, sorry, are there resources or sites that are better suited for licensed healthcare practitioners? So thank you very much for the very important question. Um, clinicians and non-clinicians are all important in this broad field of global health. I am not at all an authority on um, 
on these licensing issues, but I uh, am honored to be on a, on, a, on a board of directors with some of the leading lights of nursing who do engage in global health activities and are knowledgeable, they're good friends, and I invite the person to just send me an email and I will do my best to get them uh, some thoughtful responses from people who are, can speak authoritatively to that question. Okay, great. Um, let's see. Um, how should we set this up as an integrated experience that doesn't ruffle feathers? And I, I believe that was in a comment for, in response to another one of your answers. But how should we set this up as an integrated experience that doesn't ruffle feathers? Uh, you, you know, uh, Sophie, is it possible for the person who asked that to just elaborate a little bit and then we'll come back to that question? Okay, I, I'm good. not sure I can, I can do it justice as it's phrased and would ask the person if they could elaborate a little bit and then we'll come back to them. Would that be okay? okay. Yes, absolutely. Uh, we have another question. We usually stress that students pursue an inter internship or volunteership in low middle income countries. What about for students with weak, uh, with a weak financial situation? How to advise them to overcome this barrier? Well, this is, this is uh, an extraordinarily difficult issue. Um, there are places that are uh, well-connected uh, and well-funded. So, you, you know, I had the pleasure of teaching at Yale, and they have $28 billion in the bank, and I think 1,200 Yale students went away last summer out of 5,200, and they went away with um, Yale's money. At the George Mason University, at which I was on an advisory board, there's one global health fellowship in a university that has about, you know, 40,000 students, and a lot of them are not, not 40,000, um, but, but they have an important major in global and community health and some really outstanding faculty and students in that major. Um, I think this is, this is an enormous challenge. I, I think in the long run, um, however horrible the thought, I think anything we can do to help raise resources, both current and hopefully endowed, to try to ensure that more and more of our students can have these opportunities um, will, be, um, will be important. An another way to possibly work around this is um, many universities try to ensure that when students go abroad for a semester uh, or a year that it's tuition neutral and that financial assistance that was provided to them will continue to be provided to them. If that's the case and they can't get the, if they can't find financing for an internship, there is some really interesting study abroad program like the SIT International Honors Program like some of the SIT programs in, uh, that focus on health, like some of the CIE programs um, in, I believe, in, in Pune, India, and one other Indian program as well. And I, I certainly have had students who could not afford internships, but who were able, by virtue of the way the university did its financing of tuition, to tender their tuition in very well-run programs during the term that were certainly, um, in, in, in every case I know so far, the programs I mentioned turned out to be very transformative um, for the students. So I, I have to admit to you, honestly, um, as someone who's tried to be helpful to um, the financing of opportunities for students like the opportunities that were given to me as a youngster, th this is a great uh, challenge and I think one has to go about it uh, long run in mind short run in mind uh, and see where one can substitute different kind of things that allow the students to find financing. But I, uh, uh, th this, is a, this is a great challenge, um, I admit, and certainly more of a challenge for students from families of limited means um, and from schools with limited means, which is exactly what we don't want to happen. Please go ahead, Sophie. Great. Thank you, Richard. And I'll, I'm just going to make a quick note of the time. Uh, we're at 2.58, and I know some people may have to um, drop off, Which, and I thank you uh, for, for being uh, in the session today with us, if you do have to do that. But we, um, Richard is happy to stay on for 
a few more minutes and continue to answer questions. So for those of you who can stay with us, we very much appreciate it. Um, and at this point, well, one thing I did want to do is turn to Taryn in case there's some people uh, on the line with questions. Taryn, do we have anyone on the line? Yes, ma'am, and the caller was um, did not record a name. Caller, go ahead. Your line is open. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Prince Odu, and I'm from Nigeria. I'm a professor of uh, global health here in uh, Ashford University in Arizona. Uh, Richard, I really want to thank you for your effort and your book. Um, even if uh, I'm not presently using your textbook, I think it's very interesting, and I'm going to recommend it to the universities to see if we will adopt your book. It's very uh, 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 interesting and all the, uh, all the information in it. Um, I would like to stay in touch with you. I don't have your email. Um, if you can uh, make that available to us, that would be very uh, grateful. Uh, another thing I want to ask you is that uh, you have worked for World Health Organization in Nigeria. Which part of Nigeria did you leave? So, so Professor Ordo, it's an honor and a pleasure to meet you. I had the good fortune to work on uh, West Africa from the Gambia to Gabon to Niger and much in between for about about 10 years, partly on the education side and then on the, um, on the health side. And um, my, my most, I did not live in Nigeria, but I visited probably now 20 times or so, and I've had the good fortune to visit most of the more or less three regions of the, of the country and have certainly benefited greatly from working with the enormously talented folks there. And the most important work probably I did in Nigeria, uh, whatever my shortcomings, we're with the Harvard PEPFAR program for AIDS, AIDS treatment in the very early days in which, you know, the present minister, Dr. Adewole, John Adoko, and others were deeply involved and did a very good job. But my email will be at the end of the slide set, and it would be an honor to keep up with you. We're right around the corner from each other, and I look forward to meeting you personally. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. So and actually, good. thank you. Um, and I will uh, include your email in the the follow-up email that I send around. I think I may have removed it from the last slide, but that's quite all right. I'm, I can share it with everyone um, in the follow-up email. Um, and I have a, a comment here that uh, I'll read aloud. Another idea for developing an appreciation for languages. I have given students a three or four slide PowerPoint and have each student present a three to five minute presentation based on this common PowerPoint. However, each student does it in a different language. Same PowerPoint, same topic, but different language. It provokes some interesting discussions. That, that's really thoughtful and creative, and I'm sure the kind of thing that must make you the most popular teacher on campus. Uh, I commend you. I think it's a great idea. Uh, I've not heard that uh, before, and I, uh, I hope you'll send me a note that gives me permission to include that in, in one of my blogs so that the idea can be shared with others. I think it's, I think it's really great. Um, Again, I, I, I've done lots of role playing with lots of students at different levels, uh, and I, I'll be candid, I said this once before, I think if you're in an environment where people have affection for each other and appreciation of different groups and can handle it, role playing even along these and other lines can be very uh, valuable. Uh, on the other hand, if you're in an environment that's, high, that's very sensitive, I discourage you from role playing because I think uh, one can wind up um, in very difficult circumstances. I, I do think this is a gratuitous comment I'm going to make. I, all of these, I think, role-playing, um, this really intriguing idea about languages are very valuable. And I, I, would, I, I would, if I were still teaching full-time, I would certainly take this one up. But, but, but I do say in the, at the end of the day, I encourage all of my students to spend time in a culture other than their own. And if I were the president of Yale and nobody's going to make me president anytime soon, or of any other university, I would make it a five-year program. And everyone would have to spend one year working and living in a culture other than their own. If you were from New Mexico, you could go to East Baltimore. If you were from East Baltimore, you could go to Berea, Kentucky. If you were from Appalachia, you could go to India. If you were from India, you could go to Tanzania. But I think in a globalized world, what we have to do is encourage our students to become as global in their perspective as possible. And I think these ideas you've mentioned are really wonderful. And at the same time, I think we should keep 
encouraging our students to take advantage of every opportunity they can to, um, to live in cultures other than their own and hopefully to help the university see the importance of helping them to ensure they have money to do so. But that's a great idea. And please send me an email say, you, you will allow me to let other people know about that. Please go ahead, Sophie. Great. Uh, thank you. And um, let's see, we have a question um, about um, the future um, opportunities. If you had a crystal ball and could see into the future, what are the greatest opportunities in the next decade for new graduates? In other words, public health, allied, allied health and health sciences, uh, interested in global health. Uh, thank you for this very thoughtful and challenging question as well. Um, I, I just saw a really excellent presentation by a good friend, Dave DeFerrante, who's been at the heights of many different parts of global health. And I think he addresses this in some respects better than I can. And the same was true of a great talk I heard some months ago from Dr. Srinath Reddy, who's one of the most talented people I know and who heads the Public Health Foundation of India. Uh, I think such thoughtful people as Srinath and Dave believe that there will continue to be really important opportunities across the wide spectrum of global health activities, from advocacy through research to policy work to being a disease detective to uh, providing uh, technical support in places where capacities are weak, uh, to working with MSF or IRC as a clinician in the field um, to assist countries that have been battered or to provide during humanitarian emergencies. But I think the, mo the most thoughtful people that I know believe that the way in which this work will be done will continue to evolve. And in a somewhat caricatured way, you know, it will evolve from a kind of us and them, as might have been the case 30 or 40 years ago, to a point where more and more, more of the work is done uh, through collaborative learning modes. And that it will be important for us to help our students become first-class professionals, whether they're epidemiologists or nurses or physicians or communicators or engineers, but at the same time to become really expert at working uh, in teams, in multi, with multidisciplinary teams, with multicultural teams, and on teams that are engaged in collaborative learning across different, uh, different country settings. And I've seen that more and more, I mean, as an aside, and, Professor Ordu will laugh about this, I think, affectionately. But, you know, 30, 40 years ago on my first trip to Liberia, the Minister of Education asked me to help him write the five-year plan. Having been already in low-income countries and thinking of myself as a respectful young person, I told him that was impossible, that the plan had to be the thoughts and dreams and aspirations of the Liberian people. And he That's said, look, you're my, new, you're my new friend, but he said, uh, in the entire Liberia 40 years ago, there wasn't anybody who'd ever done educational planning besides me and him. And he told me if I didn't help him, there was nobody to help him at all. Uh, wow. that, doesn't, that doesn't exist anymore. Now what you'll see is some financier will say what they'd like to provide is support for collaborative learning between Liberia, Sierra Leone, um, so-and-so Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam uh, over a two-year period. Uh, in conjunction with three institutes in the UK and the US. And that's much more likely to be the case in the future, I think, as we think about the kind of work in which you're going to engage in, in global health. So again, these aren't necessarily my ideas, but I've certainly seen this evolution. And I think as much as I like content, we have to ensure our students get content. We have to ensure they're professional. But an important part of that professionalism will I think be learning to work in ways that will continue to evolve toward more collaborative, multidisciplinary international model. And you all, please feel free to send me emails telling, telling me I'm completely wrong. But these are, these are, I think, among the most thoughtful views I've heard, and I share them. Sophie, I'm, I'm okay with a few more questions if, if people would, would like to stay. Okay. Um, we do have a few more. Um, Probably won't be able to get to all of them, but I'm thinking maybe two or three more, um, and then we can uh, wrap it up and um, hopefully address everyone's questions um, after the session, whether it be in follow-up email or an online form or some some sort of uh, other 
a method for responding. A question about um, employment. Um, students, and especially parents, often want to know what is the likelihood of being employed in global health upon graduation? How do you respond to such questions? I generally respond by saying that there continue to be jobs in global health, both for those who wish to stay living in high-income countries and traveling from there, and for those in increasingly small numbers who will be able to work abroad if that's what they want to do. But I, but I do tell them that um, this field has become enormously popular. More and more students seem to be studying it almost everywhere all the time. And therefore, it's really important if they want to meet their aspirations that, as Greg said very well, too, they have a good conversation with themselves. They try to identify some of the things they said, and then they find a path toward becoming a first-rate professional who is seen as such by em employers now and by future employers later. Because if you want to work later at the World Health Organization, you don't start when you're 30. You start when you're 40 or 45 when people already recognize you as someone with a career of distinction. So I worry a lot about where saturation will, will be. And we want to move to a world where there are greater capacities in low and middle income countries and less need for, for support, forgive my use of the word, from high income countries. But I think for now, um, so, sometimes to my amazement, the kids I know can, at all levels continue to find um, employment that's uh, interesting and exciting for them, but I think we have to s keep our eye on this because there are an enormous number of students in the field. Um, if I may, interestingly, as a slightly comical but also serious aside, I, I always offer to talk to parents if the students worry that their parents don't want them to go someplace I'm pointing them toward. And I tell them I can talk with them both as the parents of kids who pursue global health interests as well as a uh, former global health practitioner and faculty member. But actually, almost invariably, the first thing the parents ask me is, what should I worry about? What risks will my child face if my child, even though they're 26, were to go off tomorrow to Nigeria or Liberia or Sierra Leone or Cambodia? And of course, the, the biggest risk, as all of you know, is car accidents. And uh, we usually then wind up talking about this. And then, especially if the student has asked my help, I try to help the parents understand that They've done a good job. These are mature students. We've got a little group helping students prepare, and hopefully the risk to the student will be as minimal as possible. And then I, I personally try to tell the kids how they can never be too careful in a vehicle. But the question is a thoughtful one. I think um, there are still lots of very interesting jobs in a variety of ways, but uh, I think we have to be careful just how many students we train. Sophie, please go ahead. Okay, should we take uh, one more question? I'm, I'm at your disposal. Okay, um, let's go ahead, one more question. There, there are a bunch of questions about getting a copy of the PowerPoints, um, as well as uh, repeating the names of book titles or giving recommendations for other books, which um, I think maybe we can address that in a follow-up email. Um, so I'll just throw out this one last question. How can we learn about the track records, the reputations of international health organizations from the point of view of low-income countries? You know, that, um, I, I'm not um, completely abreast, but I'm partly abreast of um, efforts that are, have been underway and continue to be underway. Um, and I think what you'll see if you look is um, some surveys, I think some of which have been quite thoughtful and others of which didn't make any sense to me at all, in which the views of um, policymakers, um, um, educated citizens, uh, and people who were supposed to be, in quotes, beneficiaries of development projects were, were all thought uh, um, as people tried to get a better understanding of how it was that the work of a variety of international organizations looked from the point of view of people 
in the countries with which they were working. I, I can try to find um, a, a substantial study that I saw not so long ago that was very much appreciated by some people and panned by others. But I think you're going to find um, this isn't an area in which, and, 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 and I'll ask Greg to send me a note if I'm wrong, but I think you'll find this is an area where there's a, there's a lot of chatter, but not so much great evidence. But I do know of some thoughtful surveys that have been done recently, as well as some other work, and I'll be happy to, to point those, uh, those out to people. Uh, back to you, Sophie. Thank you. Great. Well, I think at this point, um, we'll go ahead and wrap up the session. I did just want to point out that um, uh, Richard's book is available uh, for use um, in your courses, and we're happy to send you a complimentary review copy. Um, GlobalHealth101.com has all the information you need uh, if you want to look at sample chapters or request access to instructor materials. Um, you can do that there, or if you want to um, put through a, a request for a complimentary review copy, you can do that. Um, and then I'll just say uh, thank you so much for everyone for participating today. The wonderful feedback and comments and questions. Um, I do have uh, a record of everyone's questions. Um, so if we miss something, um, we'll certainly do our best to, to follow up and get an answer to your question. Um, oh, I do have your email address here. If you want to reach out directly to Richard, you can do that as well. Uh, his email address is on screen. Mine is as well. Feel, feel free to reach out to either one of us. Um, we will, we have recorded the webinar and we will be um, processing that and posting it uh, shortly on YouTube as well as on our uh, public health faculty lounge page on LinkedIn. If you're on LinkedIn, I invite you to join the faculty lounge. Um, and we'll see, I guess uh, that's, that's it. Uh, thank you to uh, you, Richard, very much for your presentation. That was fantastic. Sophie, thank you, and my uh, deep thanks and profound thanks to everyone who's joined. I hope to continue to be able to learn from all of you and hope you won't be shy about uh, reaching out to me and sharing all your very thoughtful ideas. So thank you all very much. Thank you again, everyone, for joining. And with that, uh, Karen, uh, I'll ask you to go ahead and close uh, the participant line.